Good morning. Uh, today's reading is on page 892 in your Bible. It's from Acts 26. No, it's actually Acts 8. We're going to be reading 26 through 39. So I'll begin with the even, and you can pick up on the odd. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? Then the eunuch asked Philip, about whom may I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and in both of them, Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And then together we can read. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. A couple of weeks ago, I preached about how there's always somebody looking for the exit. Today, I'd like to prevent, present the other side, looking for the entrance, based on this story from Acts, which is based on the story in Isaiah the prophet. St. Luke tells this compelling story about a man whose heart's desire was to be an insider, was to belong. He had three strikes against him, poor soul. First, he was a foreigner. Second, he was not white. And third, he was a eunuch in a time when you didn't want to be a eunuch. In this world, three strikes and you're out. And the story of Philip and the Ethiopian is sandwiched between powerful events that overshadow it. We might overlook it, like the 3,000 conversions on the, uh, on the heels of Pentecost and the miraculous occurrences that took place in the early church. It serves also as an interlude to the famous conversion of Saul of Tarsus. The major character of the story has no name, you might notice, simply called an Ethiopian. Nor does the star of the story hold any elevated rank, like an apostle or even a deacon. He's simply an evangelist. He tells the good news. So Philip was an under-credentialed layman, and it's a story about profiling, but it has a happy result about how an outcast finally finds access to something he wanted to belong to. 
It's a story that ought to appeal to minorities and immigrants and all other ne'er-do-wells in this society. And I tell it in hopes that we might be more compassionate toward the downtrodden for reasons not their own. Tradition calls him Judah, J-U-D-A, no H, Judah. That is the proper name for a Jewish black man. Now, this guy grew up knowing his place. He had experienced discrimination because of his genetic code that he inherited. While others were allowed to attend the temple in Jerusalem to worship, he was forbidden to go no farther than the outer court, the peripheral edge of the temple. It is the place reserved for folks like him. In spite of all that, he is persistent, and he keeps coming back to Jerusalem to worship even though he suffered the stigma of injustice inflicted on this poor guy's masculinity. But when the Mosaic Law specifically bars you from entry, there's not much hope of getting in. Deuteronomy 23 and Leviticus 20 is pretty nasty stuff for a Bible, and I only read it for those who can't Google eunuch. He whose testicles are crushed or cut off shall not enter the assembly of God. Now, I don't know how you enforce something like that today. Maybe some of them slip in. But it's not a high priority here at Lincoln. Unlike society, we don't do gender checks on visitors. So after yet another experience of almost being able to get into worship, Judah is on his way back to Africa through the Gaza Strip. And to his credit, he's reading the scrolls, Isaiah chapter 53, because they had no New Testament in those days. The Old Testament was the only Bible they had. And this is the best of the, of the book in, in the Old Testament. He was obviously attracted to the content of what Isaiah had written, but he wasn't sure that he understood it. He wanted to know for sure if he understood it right, so the spirit yanks up Philip and gets him over to that chariot to explain the meaning of God's good news for outsiders. Even eunuchs, especially eunuchs, it's the first time he'd ever heard anything like that. And he was poring over Isaiah 53. And says, can this mean what I think it means? Can it mean what it says? He'd never heard anything like it. Heaven's greatest disapproval is still reserved for those on the inside who isolate others on the outside. So when Jesus selected heroic characteristics in people, he always chose Outsiders, those who did not fit in, those who were excluded, like a Roman centurion who had faith, he said, greater than all Israel. And he wasn't even a believer in God. Or a Samaritan half-breed on the road to Jericho while the priest and the Levite walked by on the other side. Or a tax collector who admitted his need of mercy while a self-righteous Pharisee needed no mercy. Now, there's a sizable number of scriptural examples where Jesus reaches out to outcasts as he frequently devastated the smug arrogance of exclusional religion. After hearing about Jesus, what else could Judah do but stomp on the chariot brakes and be baptized by this stranger who talked about a God who accepted society's rejects. What is to prevent me from being baptized? What a text. And Philip says, there's nothing. 
And that's the story. Now, the first thing that strikes me about it is why would somebody travel more than 200 miles just to worship God? Now, this dude is crossing international borders, going to a whole lot of trouble to come such a great distance to an inhospitable place for him where he is expected to stay in his place on the outside. I wish more people around here wanted to come to worship that bad. I mean, when people won't even get up out of bed to cross the street after a tough night with the wrath of grapes, our powerful instinct to be included. Man. Strong. He's read the Bible where it says the eunuch shall not be allowed in the assembly of the people of God. He knows that. It takes only once to be religiously quarantined, and you know that is always there. You can't go in. The emasculated are not allowed to the assembly. And yet he keeps coming back. Why place yourself in a position before people who've said it a hundred ways, we reserve the right to refuse service to people like you? Peering through the lattice, wondering what's going on inside, left to ask those coming out, what was it like in there today, y'all? What scriptures did they read? Was the choir good? Could they understand the preacher? Second-handed stuff. Now why would a man travel to another country with a Bible in his lap that said, there's no place for you in here. There must be something in his heart and soul that knows that if there's a God, then there must be a place for him. The strong human desire to be included. The desire to belong it is so strong. We, we grow up being born into a family. We grow up belonging to something. We go to school looking for an entrance to life. Couples get married. Why? To be attached to somebody. Part of getting a job is more than just a paycheck. It is being accepted. Preachers looking for a church. Churches looking for people. Everybody looking for an entrance. Searching for a place to fit in. The herd mentality is real. Which makes our question so poignant. Is there anything to hinder me? Me? From being baptized? Man, I'd really like to do that. Yeah, there's, there's always something to prevent somebody in a balkanized world that majors on who gets in and who stays out and who gets humiliated. That's us. We're good at that. But I'm proud of this church's reputation to take folks in where we reserve the right to accept Everybody. So Judah kept at it. Even though the Bible, the Bible is against him. He kept at it. And so it didn't stop him. And Leviticus and Deuteronomy has little to offer this guy. In his case, the Bible is a detriment. Oh, oh, it's really hard on people like him. To think of the Bible, the good book, as a detriment. All holy books have some rough spots to answer for, don't they? But these same scriptures are his salvation. We don't want to overlook that, because this time he hit the jackpot. 
This time he ran into Philip. Who, it was no accidental meeting, by the way. He got snatched over real quick and put by the chariot. And Philip shows him that even the Bible argues with itself. And anybody who's read it knows that. And shouldn't be upset because of it. Because the Bible is a human book. Oh yeah. It's inspired by God for sure. But written by God's flawed beings of light. And yeah, there's this ghastly word about, about rejection. Like a sheep led to the slaughter as a lamb before its shears is dumb. Who will declare the family tree of the eunuch? This, folks, is from the prophet Isaiah, the most Christian book in the Old Testament. Who is he talking about, Philip? Who is this guy? He's been dismembered. He has no family tree. He sounds just like me. And liberation happens. Not in the temple, but out in the desert. And this gracious word let not the foreigner who obeys the Lord say, God will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am just a dry tree. Don't say that. Thus says the Lord, say this, To the eunuchs who obey my covenant, I will welcome into my house and give them a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which shall not be cut off. That's in the Bible too. Philip, who is this? I can't believe it. And Philip integrated that Ethiopian chariot in the, the day in which slavery was the name of the game and preached to him Jesus. So... So that's who it is. It's Jesus. Does this Jesus have a big family? Oh, yeah. He's he got the biggest family in the world, sons and daughters all around the globe. And they stop the chariot, and Judah goes, Is there any reason why I can't be baptized? I can't imagine why somebody would want to prevent somebody from deepening their faith. But he had to ask it because he knew the history. Yeah, there's always those around who scorn inclusion, who see it as their duty to remind you that you ain't from around here, that your skin is dark, and you are deformed, so you can't belong. That's the ugly side of religion, setting up strict rules to keep somebody out and make God hasten the day when we're rid of it. I wrote a book several years ago called God's Surprising Goodness, and in which I wanted to show, which I gave John a copy, I wanted to show the many ways that God's goodness is sometimes shocking. It's so good. And I came across something in the book of Romans when I was doing some research for that book, where St. Paul utilizes a phrase, two words, there is no, or th four word, there is no difference. There is no difference. Two times he says that in the book. It's a powerful way, two powerful ways in which we are all alike. He says, with reference to human sinfulness, there is no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No difference at all in that. Nobody can claim they're more moral than anybody else. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Red, yellow, black, or white, all of us. There's no difference in that regard. And the second way he says there is no difference between us is in reference to the grace of God. Not the sinfulness of man, but the grace of God. There are no faves with God. There is no difference, he says, between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. 
For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It didn't say some of them. It says every one of them. Period. Even eunuchs. I don't know how it can be any more plain than that. Which is to say church is for everybody or it's for nobody. The family of God has to remain open to all takers The only exclusion is self-exclusion because God is that kind of God. We have to be that kind of place for that's when we'll not only be living in the fine tradition of Philip the evangelist, but we'll also be living up to our name Christian. I'll tell you how they know. They'll know we're Christians, not by our differences, but by our love.